Hi, this is Michael for NCY Store, and we just got done submerging our cylinder head. You can see here, I did take it out from a little bit, uh, half a day to pretty much scrub it, so it wasn't the gasoline that actually made it like this. So just want to let you know, I still got to get inside of it, so I took a razor blade. You know, it's okay, just get a razor blade, try and use as much as you can off of this to get that. It's a carbon buildup, not addition to the motor oil that was kind of burnt out or leaked in. So most of it was actually normal. It's caused by a carbon buildup. And uh, we did the head also a little bit. You can see all the gaskets are pretty much uh, almost gone. We got a little bit left here and everything like that. So we'll probably chase a razor blade after it. But right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get this guy here. Just going to use a little, you know, scotch bright. You know, make sure it has a little bit of a grip still. And just go ahead and, you know, use your old one, of course. After your, your wife or your girl is done washing the dishes. Or if you're washing the dishes, then you can use that one there and take care of this. So you can see here, this one's ready to go ahead and... Do a clean up here, put it in this kind of a cardboard here saw. I'm gonna go ahead and keep submerging this guy in here, leave it there alone. You can see I got the bolts in there. I already took out the rocker arms and everything. The valves are still in there. Uh, the rocker arms don't really need much clean up there. There's no carbon build up there. You can see it's pretty shiny. I still have the rocker arms in there, I'm sorry. I mean the camshaft. So you can see here, this is already clean. Uh, this one we submerged it in there. You can see a little bit of scrape of the aluminum paint a little bit from the razor blade. I try not to get into the rubber o-ring a little bit. That's okay, we're gonna hit it with some of that uh, paste uh, carbon sealed on there. And we'll put that plastic in between to help dissipate the heat. Uh, you can see here, nothing with the rocker arm. This was submerged in the gasoline as well. As well as this too is a harder plastic uh, cam chain rail. So that came out okay. We're not gonna use this base gasket. I mean, we could savage it, but this was the original. You can see how uneven it is. It was from the copper spray. So I actually made a mistake. I left it for about a year before I actually used it. And usually these things stay sticky forever. They usually stay sticky. I think it was probably six months until I started noticing, you know, a lot of dust build up for it not to be sticky. So if you're thinking that you're going to wait for your gasket to not, after you spray with a copper spray, and it's not going to get sticky, you're going to wait a long time. Because it took almost half a year for it to, uh, for it to not be sticky more using the copper spray here. So for the other ones, that's just a pin. We'll probably go with the Permatex gel one for the intake manifold and also for the exhaust a little bit. Probably hit the NCY. Maybe we'll use the steel one or we'll use the Tata one that comes with it. We'll see. Um, so those are the things that I just got back from, uh, well, from yesterday, last night, from my uh, epidermia shot, they call it. It's like a steroid shot to help uh, pretty much uh, wick the inflammation away from the, the pinched nerve. So it's... Um, it doesn't just numb it like narcotic or anything. It actually does help. I feel almost 85% improvement. So the other 5% is just sort of recovering because I'm so used to not being able to tilt my leg a certain way and sleeping on a certain side. Now I realize the pain is not, not much there anymore. So now I have to readjust myself. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and submerge this. You can see here the valve covers there. Uh, it's called mercury. Uh, gasoline does vaporize. It was almost here at tip point. And just like afterward, it came like an inch lower. Now this is where it's sitting at right now. I didn't pour any gasoline out. I might have lost a few drops while I was taking things in and out. You can see here the exhaust side is really pitch black. So we're gonna try to do, and I believe that ring there that I'm mistaken what it was. Let's see if I can even fish it on this mercury water. <laughs> that little ring there, I thought, um, actually that ring right there is probably in one of these grooves right here. You can see that groove right there. That, that ring probably sits right there. I don't think it might sit on this side. It might be somewhere a little bit more wider for it. So it might be on this side. Uh, yep, it might be the exhaust side. Or it could be the intake manifold side. We'll see when we assemble it. That ring should fit in one of these two base right here. Base where the the uh, the seals are, the valve seals. So that's where the, uh, the that little thin piece of uh, round ring that I was trying to figure out yesterday was. Uh, I was just thinking back when I was like, oh, you know what? It could have popped it there. Because remember when we popped this out of here? Everything fell loose from the back, so it might just shook it off his base right there. So it's just probably just sitting there when the springs is slap on. I'm surprised the other one didn't have a ring, but... So I'm going to go and submerge this one here. I'm going to put the darkest side where the exhaust is. You can see what happened here. There, you remember the white smoke I had from the side? So in my cylinder, which is facing like this here on the bike, and we saw the smoke come out, but we couldn't tell if it was coming out from the exhaust, which is so close to it. And you look at the exhaust, it looked like it came out a little bit too, so we had the exhaust leak a little bit. But mainly it came out from right here. You can see where the blown is. See that right there? The gasket wasn't sealed, this area right here, so blown. And then also motor oil could have got in through the cam a little bit too. 
I kind of cl cleaned it now, so I can't really say no more. But I can go back in the previous video, you could probably examine it, you could probably uh, cross check it. But this is right here where the, the blown uh, gasket is right here. Head gasket, the metal one. And you can see here the marks that it left behind. Now this is from, you know, being submerged in gasoline for a good 24 hours already. Well, this one half a side anyway. So we're going to go ahead and try to put the whole thing in there and see if we can get a little bit more cleaner. Today's objective is I can't really do anything heavy. I can't move my back, uh, my, my back of course, too much strain. So I'll probably take the CVT cover off. We're no longer going to use the kick, um, kick starter here. We're going to take that complete assembly off because we're actually going to install probably an ankle biter with Allen bolts. Because I was thinking I'm going to order some Allen bolts for these anyway. And most of the time the ankle biter usually comes with the Allen bolts. And it's also a nicer design where I still can protect my... Um, you know the CVT a little bit from this side of it so I'm gonna probably get the TRS uh, ultimate ankle biter on here and you can see how it looks like and that way it'll have some protection here as well as the back end and it also allows me to because this thing right here is the one that always blocks from this frame I can never get my CVT cowl without having to drop my engine like I'm doing here so once I get it off now with the ankle biter on there I can easily take off my variator my clutch change my springs change my belt you know once I actually visually expect it now the open air does cause some safety hazard too. You use that caution. I'm not saying it's for uh, legal street use, but again, just advise. Uh, now things get caught in there, it gets entwined because it's going. To, it's taking a lot of torque from a small gear to a bigger gear, so you, it can pull anything. If it can pull your wheel on the ground level, weighing you about maybe 200 plus pounds, it can pull anything through this variator. So you got to be careful. It's not going to stop like the little uh, Dremsel tool there. So that's one caution you would worry about, especially around little kids and stuff. If you're starting your scooter and they happen to be there, you know, you know how kids are, will probe their finger everywhere. Just be really cautious when you fire it up around people in public or wherever. That way you can see it's great for aesthetic, but it's also very dangerous. <clears throat> so just keep a note of that. Uh, I think the ultimate um, cover, ultimate CVT uh, ankle biter, they call it ankle biter because I guess it hits your ankle a lot. So we'll see. This whole thing is not going to come up too much. I think it still has it where... I believe that your variator still sticks slightly below inside of it a little bit, so it does have a little bit of protection from things being able to hit your variator and knock it out because you don't want the variator to protrude out more than the cover itself to protect it, just in case you happen to land on something right here or something or come from the side. So there we go. That will probably be our project here. So we'll take this off um, as well as just get started and just clean this. Again, you can actually use um, oven cleaner, really. Um, I realized this cleaner didn't really do much for me uh, from the auto parts store. Uh, engine degreaser. You could probably get away with just using uh, un, un, um, you know, oven cleaner, your household item. And just use some scotch bright here and just kind of wipe off the uh, carbon buildup. So yeah, this is pretty much expected. Carbon will build up. It's not going to stay shiny and luminous as we thought it would, you know, when you first install it. So I just got freaked out. I thought motor oil just kind of stayed in there, you know, and did all that. But it's actually just normal carbon buildup. So what we're going to do now is go ahead and submerge this here. I mean, I still have all my, you know, I wanted to get the uh, the rubber sealed off, but these are made to be tolerant to, you know, petroleum and gasoline, so it should be fine. So there we go. Now it's going to be able to submerge a little bit more. So I'm going to give this guy a nice longer uh, bath in here while we work on cleaning this guy out here. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and start brushing this guy away. I could probably set him here a little bit. It's going to get a little messy. There we go. <clears throat> That way you got better lighting here as well. All right. So get some gloves on, gasoline, it dries out the oils on your, your hands pretty well. So you can see here all these little crescences. So I'm gonna take my Scotch-Brite, again, get a used one. You don't need to go start with a new one or anything like that, unless you don't have a used one, then go ahead and buy yourself one. They're a couple dollars for a set of couple, you know, a couple of them or three of them. There we go, look at that. If you want to, you could put some WD-40 too, that'll help. Let's see if I have some here. WD-40. Uh, this one's almost gone. Of course, it was a brake cleaner or whatever. But you know what? Let's try this guy again. Let's give him another shot. You know, if you need to, let's try and give him another shot here. It's supposed to gel out, right? Oh. There we go. Let's sit. We'll let it sit a little bit like this. How about that? Just let it sit in there. All the crest is it. Let's supposed to do its thing. All right, we'll come back to this one. And in the meantime, what we can do is we can take out the CVT cover. So hopefully this will do a little bit more magic here. Again, I'm, we don't sell this. So you can just pick it up at the auto parts store. See if that works well for you. 
All right. <clears throat> so let's go and get started on removing the CBT cover here. It's going to take an eight millimeter. You want the extension. And you remember the, the, the cardboard box I made, you'll still use that. Even though we're going to replace all our bolts anyway, just want to make sure for good practice, just in case we need to actually an urgent to put back. This is a scraper I use. I just put the razor blade on there. Remember it had the orange plastic one? Well, I found that this one was a little bit better. See, it's okay, you can scrape it like this. It's not gonna hurt anything. You'll have scrape marks and everything. But the only thing you don't wanna do with this one is just be really careful. You don't want to, um, see that right there? Probably can get a little bit more. Now that I have, oh, sorry, can't see it. It's a little gasket there. Now these gasket will eventually be covered with a, the um, either the metal, which is the cylinder head gasket, or the base gasket on the other side, so it's okay because it'll have that, you know, when you spray on this, it gets thicker. I believe that might be one reason why my cam chain was so tight, because I doubled the base gasket, even though you don't think that little piece of paper can throw off the tightness of your cam chain. But again, again, we took one link out and look how loose that was compared to a 47 one. Uh, we went back to a 46 one and that was super tight and super loose. So just one extra link. So I'm thinking the paper gasket would make a difference. If we don't double up the base gasket, the pistons will come up more. It'll create much more compression because the thinner your base gasket, the more the piston actually goes near your valve. So that's the thing what creates a lot more compression. So that could be um, maybe a good thing and a bad thing for us. We'll see. But hopefully it doesn't go too close where it hits the valve at all. So we're going to try aim for just using one base gasket and see if actually our cam chain tensioner uh, we'll actually be able to participate and do the job it's supposed to do, like tighten the cam chain. But since it's already super tightened with the current setup right now, a two double base gasket previously, we might not be able to. So let me go ahead and just throw this underneath here like this. So you can see here, so when you spray it onto the gasket, um, let's see if I have a gasket here to show you. There we go. No, oh, that's not the gasket. Maybe it's in here. Or it's probably here. Knowing me, I probably put the organized where I'm going to use it. There we go. Here's the gaze gasket. <clears throat> so when you spray it, either spray it on both sides. And I think one thing I use is I use a tie strap to kind of lift it off the ground because this thing gets sticky. Once you spray it and you flip it over, um, unless even if you're using a baking pan, I mean stainless steel, it still sticks to the baking pan. You'll have to plier it off. So what I do is I loop it with a tie strap and still try to make sure you get inside the tie strap area too when you loop it like this. You can lay it down still. That way it's a little bit off the ground so it won't stick. The minute it actually touches the ground, it becomes almost a sticker. And you don't want to stick yet until you actually place it where you need to place it. Okay, so you will spray in both sides, which we'll do that together. And then the other side as well, give it a good thorough spray. So you can see here, this add a layer of thickness to it. Just the same way when people powder coat their some of their bolts and stuff, it doesn't fit into their frame right. That little extra coating does make a difference, and I think that's what probably caused our cam chain to be a little tighter on a regular 46 normally, because we had to add an extra base gasket just in case that we thought that the 2.5 millimeter Hoka stroker might actually interfere. So let me go put this back before I forget. I keep trying to just toss things freely, and then I realize, oh man, where's this? Where's that? That's probably my fault. <sighs> I gotta make a habit of not just tossing it. Okay, um, so now what we're gonna do is again, we're gonna keep this kind of like, you know in the little gel painting area. Just let it kind of do its thing, it's magic. I don't think it'll do much though, to be honest with you. If you get oven cleaner, just easy off, you know, heavy duty if you want to. Spray it on there, leave it for a while. You can probably even just get like, you know, a scotch bright and just, you can wipe it all off or even like hose it down. You can see it comes off much better. I don't know why the auto parts, uh, parts does not make our, you know, formula does not make it like household, you would think, you know what I mean? It's weird that households are less fumy and yet they're more powerful. So um, let's go and get started on removing the CVT unit here. I'm going to take the extension. The reason why I want to uh, remove it too because I actually want to see inside of it. I haven't seen inside of it since uh, everything's been put on the last video we did on the CVT. So this would be a good time to take it off and see really what's going on in there. You'll need a long extension because it's pretty deep in there. And then you need an 8mm socket. Let's see if I can find one. I, I see all the 10mm, which I don't need. And then when I look for a, a 10mm, all I see is an 8mm one, which I don't need. So it's always like that, isn't it? No, I could get one of those little nice socket assembly. I'm sure, you know, that way you guys are not like pulling your hair out thinking, you know, why am I keep on trying to do it this way when I can easily just grab a, a proper extension. I believe this is the 8mm. Yep. Perfect, a lot of length here, but that's okay. More than we need. 
Uh, what was I gonna show you here? Yeah, I was gonna, oh yeah, take the box out. Here's our Dremzel tool. I was gonna use this primer, but it's gray. I might as well just say, hey, one minute, I'm gonna have to paint it black again anyway. So I ordered one, I believe it's enamel, and you spray it on there, it protects your rust, but I'll say at the same time, um, I guess it's enamel, and it's already glossy black. You know, whenever you get time, if you want to paint it over more, or enamel, you might not even need to. It just depends on the brand, I guess. So I ordered some black one, um, so I'm not gonna plan to use this, uh, this one right here. For like the handlebars and stuff, you know, the big areas, I don't wanna use like my little, See, I bought also a little pin. Let's see here, I can find it in here, all the way underneath. So I bought one of these too, right? And this one has a little brush too. You can fix like the little light areas where you don't want to spray all over. So this would be good to put a little brush here, like a pin. And it's also gloss black, which I think most of my scooter frames are. Sort of a gloss black. It's not like glossy glossy, but it's glossy enough. You know, some of the chip areas here, you know what I mean? Uh, this is aluminum, it's never going to get rusted, but I just don't want to cover it up, make it look a little bit more more nicer. You know, a lot of chips and stuff, you get them. So this pin might actually come into play for those little small detail area where you don't want to spray your whole seat off. You know, you just want to spray a certain, I mean, you just want to tap a certain area like that. But this, the spray one that I got is the enamel one like this, but it says enamel on there. And it will protect the rust and also help hopefully try to get off. Um, but you'll need to sandpaper it off first, most of them. Okay, so here it goes. Here's my bucket here for the old style. I still have it here. Did not change it. The flywheel, the crankcase. This is supposed to say about, I think it's going to be the right hand crankcase really in the flywheel. So these two should go hand in hand. And this one should have been the CVT and the transmission cover, which is correct. All right, so let's go ahead and go back in there and uh, get that started. So here we go. Cracking out the crankcase for the Long time in a while now. I think we probably opened this last almost a year ago. Now it's been that long. Same SSR as in scooter. That, well, you guys never seen the cover because it was never put back on. But this is how it looks like. The ankle body will come in a pretty much, I think it's in the raw aluminum color. So we can powder coat it. But I think the raw aluminum looks nice. I think it'll probably match my wheel just, just perfectly fine. If you remember, there's going to be it's a long case. So it's going to have 10 bolts, not like 8 bolts. And you don't have to remove all 10. Some of them are just actually holding down the thing like that. Oh, another thing I want to point out to you. You remember the drain bolt we had here for the CVT? Well, I took out the spiral. And this right here that has a bolt. This bolt is usually actually the same bolt as on the CV carburetor drain bolt area. And another thing is actually I found out that the PWK, you guys probably know this. I just found, found out. The reason why it doesn't really need a drain bolt is because that 17 millimeter is actually has like sort of an opening on the thread. So when you actually open it, let me take it out. That way I can show you too. Okay, I put it in nicely here. It won't get in the way. Okay, and also you probably don't have to loop the cable much because there's already Teflon. If you want to, I was told that you can use some three in one oil or something from some kind of hardware store like Ace or something if you have one around there or Lowe's or Home Depot. But anyway, you don't really have to lube it much, you know, because there's already Teflon here. This is the Tata throttle cable here for PWK. And what you do is when you loosen this right here, which we're going to loosen, you can see it now. 17 millimeter, just like all the rest. You know, just like our oil drain premium kit here. And you can just kind of, you know, I'll still take a little socket to it just in case I feel like Finger fatigue, and I, I don't know if I actually tighten it all the way, so I'll still do that. But I'm, right now, I feel finger fatigue, I can't even actually spin it off. So, let me get a socket here. Come on, guy. There we go. I'm gonna take it off for you. That way, you guys can really see what's, what's that little hole that's in there. See? So you really don't need a rubber cap because you have to take the whole thing off. Because there's no way you're going to get to the bottom and unscrew this and be able to get the opening so it can actually flow the fuel line anyway. So this rubber piece right here is not really needed. I just put it there. I guess I just don't want the hole to get maybe clogged. Maybe kind of dirt go in there. So, well, that's why I say now. But <laughs> before, I really thought that was the only way to hold it down. So there it goes. Uh, you guys see it right now. You see there? There's a little opening. Let's see if I get that opening there. Just... I guess you could say right above the idle jet, there's a little opening right there. Well, that opening actually leads over here to the drain bolt area. We got the proper name for it. I just call it the drain bolt. Uh, not the drain bolt because there's no bolt in there. But the CV1 would have had a drain bolt like somewhere right here. It screws in. Well, that same screw actually would use 
for the end of the cable too for your um for your drain hose so that's why they made it this way because it's actually interchangeable you can take this out if you had a cv uh, k car uh, carburetor and normally that drain bolt that locks it in because it doesn't have one of these bigger drain bolts this is pretty much your drain bolt here for your pwk so you can see there's a little hole there see that there's an opening there there's also opening on the other side too i didn't realize that too there's two openings so you got two openings right the minute you twist it loose eventually those openings will travel the fuel you can see here the fuel allows one opening from this side coming to travel out to that side so it makes a bridge connection you know it doesn't have to be perfectly aligned because you know liquid can travel through these threads no problem what really keeps it in there is that rubber o-ring right here so there you go i just want to share that with you because i didn't realize that too it had holes there so this is actually your drain bolt so there you go i'm going to tighten it back so you really don't need the rubber hose unless you're just me and want to make sure you protect anything that might have crawled in there and lived in there uh, make a temporary house all right so you want to do hand tighten this first because these threads are so they're thin they're not like really long thread and you can strip them or cross thread them okay and then you can take your socket wrench righty tighty just go by a little bit of feel to see where it usually will stop on zone you'll start there you go see it won't go anymore like you're hitting a bump like hitting a wall see it just ricochets that's it and maybe just a little bit tip a little snug that way um so that's it that's for your pwk setup again this was actually the auto enricher manually now they do make cables for this that you can it doesn't go all the way to your handlebar you'll need to go all the way to your handlebar if you want to you can make that way but normally they have a cable that will come out to the outside of the plastic of your uh, scooter and you can tug on it and then what's what happens is it just works as like your auto enricher just you're manually tugging on like everything else here like the throttle here there's no vacuum suction from the the engine that's actually opening the vacuum where the fuel can go in like a cvk so the pwk what it is is you open this up when you're first you know starting your scooter only especially in the cold winter time sometimes you might have to do this you know quite often than you should but if you just live in the regular climate you know typical spring or summer weather you should be fine you get this flooded in there first time when you're first starting out the carburetor and when it gets filled up and everything accordingly you'll start noticing that you know your engine is running properly then you can go ahead and push back down and if it doesn't go push back that okay see how it locks in place and then you can just push it back down like this there you go and then this again is just your vent your ventilation i stick the original black hose that came hanging down anyway and you remember when i tilted my carburetor here that vent hole can actually still pour a lot of gasoline out through it as well so if you're planning to go upside down just make sure you cover your vent holes before you decide to do that um other than that that was it on the pwk and this is your idle uh mixture screw and this is your idle screw look how close they are together right you remember on the cvk we had to we can well i can hand turn it with my ncy one which i still think is a better um grade and material compare but then again you also look at double the price to the ncy was closer to about one I think 149 if I can't remember and this one was, was somewhere around the 100 you know on uh, near the you know the 100 only so I think it was just made better material I can almost feel the sandiness of the aluminum compared to the NCY one was a little bit more polished uh, it was a much more a uh, polished aluminum housing but they do have a Canon one too because NCY is made by Canon Canon makes it for NCY I should say and then Canon also makes their uh, PWK too which is a little bit more expensive than the OKO one almost I believe uh, d uh almost d uh double and a half but you can see why because it all goes into materials and craftsmanship but i think this is a great value though uh for what you need it for now i'm not sure why did i did this incorrectly or something uh because i'm seeing a little bolt holes here and here mm, i don't think so because all this is aligned right so i'm not sure why there's an empty bolt hole here an empty bolt here by the way i also put two here on top as well allen bolts so it's all set up for us if i didn't show you guys that yet so yeah idle mixture screw idle screw this one you can pretty much thumb it and kind of get your idle right what this does is it pretty much adjusts the tensions of the cable being drawn here right here remember that little cable that we inserted ourselves so you can see here i could pull it from right here much easier see is that kind of angle a little break in there so when you adjust this right here you know you can probably adjust it with your hand really you can see how much it closes down when you turn it to the left <coughs> this little ventura uh door here you know i call it the indiana jones door where it just comes down like this on you there you go see that and the needle should never come all the way out you know it just stays in there 
and next to the main jet housing right there. So yeah, this will adjust just a little bit here. So you could play around with it just depending on how much uh, cabling and their throttle setup, how much turn it already pre-done onto the throttle sleeve on the other end. You can adjust your idle screw here and then you can go ahead and adjust your, um, uh, your air, uh, air fuel mixture screw here, which is your idle mixture screw. So many names will confuse you like the pilot jet, slow jet, AKA idle jet. Um, so you would normally with this one is preset. We can set it to, let's see how many turns it actually is. Okay, I haven't twisted yet since this came in the package, but let's go and count the turns and then we'll go back to our CVK, uh, CVT setup here. CVK, CVT, all these names. Okay, so clockwise to pretty much thin it out, close it. Half a turn. Full turn. It's like a full turn and a quarter, a little bit, a little bit more slightly than a quarter. So it's a full turn and a quarter, which is probably perfect. So we're gonna back out the same way. Okay. Wait. A quarter turn. Half a turn. Full turn and a quarter. Right there. Let me make sure, okay? Okay, there we go. We're gonna start. You know, we're going to start right here, okay? This is this is our quarter turn. Half a turn in the quarter. A full turn in the quarter. So there it goes. We're sitting at a full turn in the quarter right now, which is ideal to start off with. So it's not going to be uh, too rich yet, and it's not going to be too lean yet. So you still have. And then what you do is you when you start everything up, you make sure you get this opened up because you want to be able to actually flood your uh, air and fuel mixture properly and then when it actually get to the uh, you know full then you can go and close it back down like that so i guess they do have make a little mechanism where you pull on the cable like this you probably have to pull and hold it because i figure if you pull and hold it like this it snaps up like that then you're gonna need some way to push it down but i think the throttle cable comes with a mechanism also that it'll probably allow this this probably won't clip anymore it'll probably just have you hold it or click on the other end and that way you don't have to reach underneath and kind of manually try to reach over for this little, you know, injection right here. So, yeah, that's it. That's on the PWK here. I can't wait to install that bad boy. The 232 setup, it's going to be, um, I think it's going to work. Um, again, I haven't tried it yet, so we're going to find out with, between each other. Now, I was told that. I was going to say, why don't I just do this? I get a Tata cylinder jug, just like the SSPG cylinder. However, the Tata cylinder, I forgot. The cylinder height on the jug is actually a little bit longer because Tata makes it that way. That means you probably won't even be able to squeeze this onto the SSPG. So we actually have to use the SSPG cylinder jug more than likely. But you can't interchange the piston though. You can actually put a 63 mil. Let's say if I wanted to go and replace this with a forged piston, which you know just the performance you won't know it right away at all. But in the long run, you can see that the forged pistons will hold um, reliability issue much better than if you were going with the cast piston here so this is a cast piston you can see a little engraved marks and also you can tell by the back too how it's kind of you know cast on you can see the cast lines a forged one is pretty much almost like a solid piece you won't be able but it's still a nice really uh, good cast piston from SSPG so we're gonna go ahead and keep it the way it is this setup right here we're not gonna replace this cylinder jug with a Tata one we were gonna go with 63 millimeter Tata one which is commonly used in a lot of uh, players razor because they actually fit really, really well uh, so but we're and we could probably pair it with again with the um, the um, the Tata here the big bore, I mean the big head, the biggest one they got is a 30.5 to 26.5. So normally used for a 232. And it says right here the chain recommended, and you can see it here. This is 92, and 63 millimeter is pretty much the bore. Well, I'm not sure what the 63 millimeter is for, but it says for 63 millimeter, so that might work actually for a 232 and a 63 millimeter. So yeah, it also inscribes in here as well. If you ever see Tata, they try and be informative as possible. There we go because they're expert engine builders, right? So you can see here, it recommends a 92 cam chain. And 92, if you take it and divide in half, it's a 46 link chain, which that's what we got there. So it's 57 millimeter, it fits the stud spacing. And it's 18 cc, whatever that will probably mean, I believe it's something else with the compression ratio. And then for 63 millimeter or so. So it looks like it's made for it. Uh, so hopefully I don't crush my spark plug that's in there, my neurinium. There we go. 
should have screwed that spark plug in ahead of time, but that's fine. All right, so we're probably gonna stick with just a complete set of base gas from SSPG 63 millimeter. Use this one, brand new one, for spraying with the copper spray as well, and both of them, and the paper base gasket on the base side. So we'll leave this alone. Let's go and continue back what we're talking about as far as trying to get our CV cover off. We're gonna set that aside. We won't have to worry about it anymore when we change out tuner. I don't know what the weather conditions, if it rains, you know, if it you know rains, well, hopefully, you know, you have your plastic cover protect you a little bit too, so it's not gonna do that. And then you got the wind and everything, but hopefully it doesn't create a funnel where it sucks the rain straight into your CVT cover uh, inside of it anyway. I think without the, which I hardly ever use this anyway, and the mechanism just kind of clunk, clunk, clunk. What it does when your barrier spins, it still hits that little starter, um, Kickstarter gear that we had to pull out in order to get our crankshaft out. So I'll show you in a little bit here what I'm talking about if I can actually get this off by now. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. You remember our uh, cardboard trick here? We can start from left to right, uh, right to left, or however. Just remember where the pattern is so you can actually put it back. We're gonna use eight millimeter. Take it off. All right, let's see my resolutions. There you go. Let me twist it to the eight millimeter point. You can see it. There you go, my eight millimeter. So we're gonna start. Uh, first thing we do, we can try to take this one off here. Okay, I was just saying there, we did try it. Well, with this one, I guess I had it on pause this whole time. Wasn't sure if you heard me about the Nordlock. We tried the Nordlock to see how it spins and everything. Uh, so if you already got that video part of it, I hope you did, but if not, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I talked about it. We did try to put it in there and we saw that it did create a thread pattern here. You can see the Nordlock thread pattern. Uh, let's see if I can get back to the lighting. See that? You can almost see the Nordlock thread marks right there. See that little light one? Yeah, that was from these Norda locks. So we tried it, it you know, gripped in and we opened it back up. Now you can't even tell which one I just used because they all look the same to me. So you can still reuse them. So they're pretty good. We're gonna probably, probably put in here, the clutch, the variator, the flywheel area, and one for our front wheel to keep it, that bolts from staying in there just to make sure I never had it fall off of me. And also perhaps even if it fits onto our rear wheel, I think it should, you know. Uh, if I can see it right now, I can show you here. We can take it all over there and just try. I think it's pretty much exposed one of the thread area. So we can actually see if it goes in. There it goes. It might be a little bit too smaller for it actually. No, it won't fit actually. So this one takes a way bigger axle bolt. But it might fit the front wheel one. Let's see the front wheel one will fit. <laughs> yep, the front wheel one will fit just fine. So we'll be able to put in the front wheel but not our um, rear axle one. Which is fine, you know, I think with the disc brace and everything, if it falls out, you'll feel it right away before it becomes very urgent that your wheel just flies out, you know what I mean? You got your swing arm, you also got your shocks. It's gonna hold it down, so it's got a lot of level of security before it actually breaks off. So what we're gonna do right now is take off our variator, inspect our, you see there's a washer here. And again, it didn't recommend you use the washer, you can see here in the red. So I'm kinda, kinda concerning. You know, because it doesn't allow you to look at the red one. That's the washer there in the red where they marked it out. So they don't want you to use anything in between the the Norda Lock uh, washer uh, with the bolts. So they want to make it all contact. So they want to go from here. Like I said again, I prefer to have the washer because it spreads out the dispersion of the, the torque on the bolts much more against the clutch bell or variator. So let's inspect our variator rollers and see how much of a, a wear that we had. So our belt looks good though. I mean, doesn't look really oh, bad at all. There you go, see no uh, leaks here also. So that's a good sign. We installed a Viton oil seal transmission. So that looks excellent. So now, let's go ahead and inspect our, oh, careful, I'm gonna take this and put it nicely aside. I can save my gasket. Gasket got a little bit of oil here. That's probably from all kinds of stuff that maybe got squeezed in. You know, I think maybe my fuel and everything, remember Ken, was leaking from the the drain bolt area. I didn't put it enough securely, so that probably might have been. Can't smell it really, can't tell by the smell. So we'll put that aside. And let's go and check out our variator rollers, see if they flatten out, or Dr. Pulley. Again, these are 15.5 grams Dr. Pulley uh, sliders on there. And you can see how I'm holding here. Take out the boss. How many times have I fell on the camera already? Tripod. 
Okay.